This conversation is taking place at the DuPont Environmental Center in the Russell W. Peterson Wildlife Refuge. We're talking with Delaware Senior Senator Thomas R. Carper. We're at the DuPont Environmental Education Center on Wilmington's Riverfront. Welcome, Senator. Thank you. Uh, I think that uh, it's uh, there are issues that uh, that you all are confronting in Congress uh, that are uh, important, of course. But I think that the overriding issue, in my judgment, is the whole financial health of our country. Um, you uh, you didn't vote for the latest uh, uh, effort to sort of curb some of the uh, spending, but because I think you said wasn't enough of it, and uh, and the tax increase. Can you, do you want to tell us why you uh, were, what, six people out of the Senate that didn't vote for that? There's a, uh, an economist over at Brookings, the Brookings Institute, his name's Bill Gale. He described the, uh, he said, Congress in voting for the fiscal cliff deal. He said, Congress has uh, kicked a, a rather large can down a very long road, not very far. And uh, the, I think most, uh, most people, who are knowledgeable who study this stuff know there's three things we need to do. Number one, we need to uh, overhaul the uh, entitlement programs, especially the health, uh, health care entitlement programs, in ways that save money, don't savage old people, and preserve those programs for the long haul. That's number one. Number two, uh, we need to raise revenues. If you look back to when we had four years of balanced budgets in a row, just like a, a dozen years ago, during uh, the last four years of Bill Clinton's administration, revenues is a percentage of GDP, gross domestic product, so about 20 to 21 percent. Last year was 15 to 16 percent. And the third thing we need to do is literally look at every nook and cranny of the federal government. Everything we do from agriculture to defense to you know, housing to education, transportation, health care, and figure out how do we get a better, better result for less money. Those are three things. And uh, as it turns out, uh, we raise some revenues. We raise the, uh, the rates on uh, upper income uh, folks. But uh, on the other two uh, areas really didn't do enough. Well, that sort of brings up another question. In, in less than 20 days or 24 days, um, we have the, uh, the sequester that will take place. Now, you're talking about making cuts in, in across the government, but is, uh, is, uh, is a mindless 20% no matter what cut the way to do that? It doesn't seem to me as though it is. The, the problem with sequ across the board sequestration where we cut everything by the same percent, 5, 10, 15%, the problem there is we, there are some areas where I should be spending money. And there are three areas that the president talks about, Bill, uh, Ben Bernanke talks about, I talk about. And uh, number one is to invest in the workforce to make sure that we're uh, producing uh, people for a workforce who have uh, skills, especially in the, the STEM areas, the science, technology, engineering, math areas. Number two, to, in, uh, to invest in infrastructure. Right here, uh, less than a mile from uh, I-95 and 495, but our transportation infrastructure in this country is falling apart. And number three is to invest in research and development that can lead to products, to goods that we can build in this country and sell all over the world. That's, those are three areas we should be investing in. If we just do across the board 5, 10, 15 percent cuts, we, we cut the areas where we ought to be investing as well as the areas where there's some fat. Well, it seems to me it's the cowardly way out. I mean, if you do across the board cutting, nobody can blame you specifically for anything. But if you actually think about what you're doing and make decisions that are based on uh, you know, sort of an intelligent analysis of what's needed and what isn't. Uh, why can't that happen? That's the way most businesses work. Why? I mean, not that government is business. I don't hold that. But why can't people think in the Congress? The uh, I think the idea of the sequester is to hold it out there as a threat that we're going to cut something out of everything, and in order to sort of scare people into uh, to make uh, making the smarter decision that you're talking uh, that you're talking about. Um, uh, again, I, I, if you look at the entitlements, entitlements are things that we're entitled to by virtue of how we've worked, how long we've worked, our age, and that sort of thing. We spend in Medicare, we'll spend about $600 billion, I think, this year in Medicare. The uh, fraud costs in Medicare are anywhere from 5 to 10 percent of the amount of money that we're spending. If, we, if it's only 5 percent and we could eradicate just half of that 5 percent, uh, we'd be saving about $300 billion a year. In one year, over 10 years, that's about $3 trillion dollars. Well, let me give you an example. It's, it's no secret. I, you know, I'm dealing with cancer. Uh, when I first was diagnosed, uh, I, I went to the, the oncologist and, and he recommended that I get a second opinion. I could have gotten four, I could have gotten a second, a third, a fourth, a fifth, and Medicare would have paid for every one of them, no questions asked. That makes no sense. 
Does it? Does it make sense to you? We, uh, let me just, just back up just a little bit. I said 5% of $600 billion is uh, $300 billion a year. It's not. It's $300 billion in 10 years. But, uh, what I mean, those we, kinds the, of things make for, no for sense. Year, one of the reasons why we spend way more money for health care than any, anybody else in the world, we spend uh, 16, 17 percent of gross domestic product for health care. Japan, they spend eight. We spend about 50 percent more than Norway. They're the next closest to us. They get better results. They cover everybody. Among the things that we need to learn from others in, around the world, and, and outfits like Cleveland Clinic, Mayo Clinic, uh, Kaiser Permanente, is to move away from uh, what you're describing as a fee for service, where it's a sick, uh, sick health care deal, where it's not a uh, well, uh, well, health care deal where we're actually incentivizing people to take care of themselves. We focus on prevention and and and, and wellness. And one of the uh, one of the things we attempt to do in the Affordable Care Act, and frankly, one of the things that's happened on its own, is we're moving away from a fee for service health care delivery system. We're doing a better job of coordinating the delivery of health care. But that, that's a major paradigm shift. In the healthcare like, industry, you know, in the and Navy, it isn't going to happen In the tomorrow. Navy, well, it's not going to happen tomorrow, but it is happening. And uh, some of the major health uh, insurance companies like United Healthcare, which is a huge one, are starting to make that kind of paradigm shift as well. Well, right. I mean, isn't it, you can't penalize people for what happened to them, but you could reward healthy behavior. You could say your insurance costs will go down if we you do. don't smoke, yeah. if you lose yeah. weight. Uh, one of the provisions in the health care law, which is now becoming effective, is a provision that I co-authored that says, employers, you can provide a, a discount f f to the, your employee of as much as 50%. If they are overweight, lose weight, continue to lose weight. If they smoke, stop smoking, continue to stop smoking. And the idea there is to incentivize people to do what they ought to be doing anyway. But when they do it, they'll actually be not just healthier, but they'll also be financially better off. Thank you, sir. Oh, no, no, thank you. Thank you so much. You're connected with Content Delaware.